Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I'm Mara Herman, Health Policy Specialist here at the Ecology Center, and I'll be your moderator for today. Here is our webinar agenda. Currently, all attendees are in listen-only mode. If at any time during the webinar you have a question, please use the chat box to share it. After our presentation from Kendra, we'll have time for questions. Um, please note today's webinar is being recorded and materials from today's presentation will be available tomorrow. So our learning objectives for today are after the webinar, you should be able to identify health effects of pesticide usage and being able to identify where pesticides show up in the food system. And we're really lucky to be joined by Kendra Klein this afternoon. Kendra is the senior staff scientist at Friends of the Earth, where she leads work on food and farming solutions. She is a writer, researcher, and advocate with over 15 years of experience in environmental sustainability, food, agriculture, and environmental health. Prior to joining FOE, she coordinated farm to institution work at the California Healthy Food and Healthcare Campaign and worked at Breast Cancer Action on Chemical Policy Reform and Corporate Accountability Linked to Pink Ribbon Fundraising. Kendra has apprenticed on organic farms in California and Hawaii. She is a 2011 Switzer Environmental Fellow and has written for The Nation, Gastronomica, Civil Eats, Food Tank, and EcoWatch and peer-reviewed journals. She holds a BA in Interdisciplinary Studies from Miami University of Ohio and a PhD in Environmental Science Policy and Management from UC Berkeley. And so with that, I am going to turn it over to Kendra um, for her presentation. And thanks again for joining us today, Kendra. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna share my slides here. Great. Uh, okay. Is is the volume uh, is the volume good? Can you hear me? Yeah, you sound great. Okay. Perfect. Great. So thanks all so much for this opportunity to share information with you today. Um, as Mara said, I'm at Friends of the Earth, and I'm going to talk about agricultural pesticide use. I'm primarily focusing in the U.S. Um, and some of the research we've been doing and the, the advocacy we've been doing to shift to a food system that does not rely on toxic pesticides. So we use over a billion pounds of pesticides in the US every year. And pesticides have really been making the headlines lately. Um, these, this is an article from February uh, talking about plummeting insect numbers globally and the main drivers uh, are habitat pesticide use other practices associated with intensive agriculture some more headlines recently around glyphosate which is the active ingredient in monsanto's roundup weed killer uh, associating glyphosate with an increased risk of non-hodgkin lymphoma so the USDA every year tests for food residues of pesticides. They test some 10,000 samples. These are primarily fruits and vegetables, although each year they choose uh, another category of foods to test. And 77% in, in 2016 had residues. About 99% of those are under the legal limits, but we're gonna discuss that in a minute. The residues that we find, and this is just for apples, um, have been linked to a whole range of health problems. So you see up to 47 different types of pesticides on apples alone. And then we can just go through that list. They're associated with carcinogenicity, hormone disruption, neurotoxicity, uh, developmental and reproductive toxicity, and then of course, toxicity to honeybees. There's a wonderful app and website called What's on My Food, uh, moderated by Pesticide Action Network, where they take all of that USDA data and they um, boil it down into a format where you can search by food or you can search by pesticide and uh, really dig into that data on food residue if you're interested. 
And we know that exposure is ubiquitous. So this is a small study by Environmental Working Group, uh, and they tested umbilical cord blood. Our national data comes from uh, the NHANES um, uh, survey and analysis, but NHANES doesn't test for children under five. So in part, Environmental Working Group was interested in children's exposure and of course, babies exposure in utero. And what they found, um, just this small analysis of 10 infants was 200 industrial compounds, including 21 out of 28 pesticides tested for. And we know that cumulative exposures add up. So if we look at organophosphates, which is a class of pesticides associated with neurological harm, including increased risk of ADHD, learning disabilities, autism, Parkinson's. A uh, 2009 study found that about 40% of US children may be exposed at levels greater than benchmarks for neurological harm. So this starts to belie the problem with uh, the legal limits. I know you all have been talking about other environmental health concerns and likely have some background in this. Um, despite food residues being uh, under legal tolerances, we're exposed to a, a cocktail of different pesticides and to a cumulative amount of pesticides that, as this study shows, can exceed benchmarks for harm. I just want to note this study is from 2009, and um, organophosphates is a class that we have been slowly reducing use of. Um, so, you know, as as time goes, this type of statistic might change. Um, but again, what it's telling us is that the cumulative exposures matter. And of course, pregnant women, infants, children, and adolescents are more vulnerable. These periods in our life where we are going through rapid development and small exposures can have a lasting and lifetime impact. Farm workers and their families in rural communities are also more vulnerable because they're getting much higher levels of exposure. Um, so between a third and a half of all farm workers in the US reside in California. I'm out here in California, um, uh, in Berkeley. That's about 500 to 800,000 people. Um, I did dig up some data on Michigan and I'm from Wisconsin. Um, so great to be talking to Midwesterners. Uh, in Michigan, food and agriculture is the second largest industry. Uh, you, you all produce over 300 ag commodities and are number one in types of commodities that require farm labor. So if you think of those miles and miles of cornfields and soy that are also in the Midwest, um, those require much less labor than these types of crops where people need to be out in the fields um, harvesting and hand picking. Um, so Michigan has a a large farm labor population, both migrant workers and um, permanent farm workers. You can see that spread there. So I picked out just one study that illustrates this, the, the higher exposures of rural communities. This is out of UC Davis. And they, again, are looking at that class of pesticides called organophosphates. And they found that mothers who live within a mile of fields uh, where organophosphates were applied had a 60% higher chance of having kids with autism. And that link was strongest for a particular organophosphate called purpurifos. Here's another study that demonstrates uh, the exposure of rural communities. This is an older study and it's out of Mexico. But what you're seeing is, uh, the fact that children at about four and a half years, this is the, the study population, uh, one marker of their development is their ability to draw a human figure. And what you're seeing on the left is children who lived up in the foothills where they had um, much less pesticide exposure. And on the right is children who lived in the valley where there was a great deal of agricultural pesticide use and therefore exposure. Um, and, and this is one indication of neurological impairment from that exposure. And that link there is an eight minute video. Um, I think Mara will share these slides afterwards, but I encourage you uh, to, to check out that video if you're interested. And I find it's a powerful thing to share in classrooms and other places if you want to 
get this message out. California has a, a bit of our own Yaki Valley, um, the Salinas Valley, known as the salad bowl of the nation or even the salad bowl of the world, uh, where again, we're producing the types of crops that require a great deal of farm labor. There's been a long-term uh, cohort study out of UC Berkeley called uh, Chamacos that enrolled 600 pregnant women in 2000 and has been following their children ever since. So they now have a, a set of 19 year olds um, that are still participating in the study. And of the many, many findings that have come out, uh, one set is about mother's exposure to organophosphates during pregnancy. And what you're seeing there is a whole set of reproductive and developmental impacts uh, associated with that exposure. Despite all of this data showing us that many of the pesticides that we are routinely using are linked to health problems, we're using ever more pesticides in the US. Uh, farmers are on a pesticide treadmill. Despite our, uh, um, well not despite, it's because of our use of pesticides and because uh, nature is a, an active force, uh, we have weeds and insects that rapidly develop resistance to pesticides and farmers then rather than turning to ecological practices that could help reduce overall pesticide use often turn to using ever more and stronger pesticides and there are many reasons for that um, which we could discuss um, at length but I thought this was a really interesting poll of Iowa farmers who reported feeling that pest management is a never ending technology treadmill. So they themselves um, perhaps feel trapped in this. Um, despite our increasing use of pesticides, farmers are losing more of their crops to pests today than they did in the 1940s. So this is really a failed model. And we're gonna talk a bit about um, what are the solutions. Why are we still so deeply entrenched in this model? Um, who wins and who loses? Of course, uh, we all lose in terms of public health, uh, massive environmental concerns, but there's a really uh, powerful set of companies that are deeply invested in the economic returns they get from the system. In the past few years, we've seen some really massive mergers. So Bear and Monsanto um, have merged, Dow and DuPont, China and Syngenta, and then uh, BASF. These are the, the top four companies producing agricultural pesticides. And they have a great deal of lobbying power. So this is just a snapshot of Dow's ex uh, lobbying expenditures. Um, at the beginning of this administration, uh, the EPA was poised to ban chlorpyrifos. That is the organophosphate that I mentioned had the strongest link in that one study to um, increased risk of autism. The data is so crystal clear on chlorpyrifos. The EPA itself has determined that no level of exposure is safe. Um, so the Obama administration was poised to ban it. And one of the first things that uh, Scott Pruitt did as head of EPA at the time was to reverse that ban. Um, and people have drawn the connection to direct spending from Dow on the Trump campaign and even on Trump's inauguration um, and, uh, and then the subsequent reversal of that ban. So we know, this is the good news, we know that we can reduce exposure. So I believe that you may have watched a video about this study um, before joining today, uh, but this was published in February. Um, I worked on this study with co-authors from UC Berkeley, from UC San Francisco, and from the Commonweal Institute. And uh, we found four families across the country um, and had a six-day intervention. So we, te we took urine samples from each of these family members um, every morning. For six days on a conventional diet, we said just eat your regular diet, um, but please don't eat any organic food during this phase. And then we switched them over to an entirely organic diet. Um, 
and we counted the first days of each phase as a washout and ended up testing um, 10 samples each, five and five, uh, for each family member. And we ended up doing their shopping for them. We had research assistants on the ground who shopped for them during the organic phase and also uh, trained chefs who prepared their meals because we know any busy family could easily uh, one night say, oh, we're just gonna go out for pizza. So we wanted to make it as easy as possible for them to really um, stick to that intervention. And we substituted everything down to oils and spices. And uh, our, the lab that we worked with at UCSF, uh, Roy Girona's lab, tested for that middle column, which you're seeing is the analytes. Um, some of those are metabolites of uh, the parent pesticides, and some of those are the pesticide itself. So if you look all the way down, we tested for clothianidin, that's a neonicotinoid. We tested uh, directly for 2,4-D. These are the major classes of pesticides that we're using in the US, organophosphates, pyrethroids, neonicotinoids, um, and then a whole set of herbicides of which uh, 2,4-D is one. Um, we also tested for some fungicides, we, which we didn't find, uh, which is interesting because you know, we, we find those frequently as food residues. So it may have been something in the, the test method um, or we're not sure otherwise why we don't find those. Of all of the analytes that we found, everything dropped within just six days on an organic diet. So you can look across there. You see uh, a large drop in the neonicotinoid um, and the largest drops in the organophosphates. MDA is malathion. TCPY is the metabolite for chlorpyrifos. So we, we found uh, each of these in every participant um, and found these drops across the board. Pyrethroids um, had some of the lowest drops. So, you know, on average, they dropped by half. Pyrethroids are a class of pesticide that uh, were likely to have exposures beyond a diet because they are used frequently for pest control in schools and houses and other buildings. Uh, similarly with 2,4-D, that's an herbicide that is frequently used um, in other locations. So we are, we, we're interested in dietary intervention, but of course uh, we are getting other exposures through other routes. So we know that people respond not just to facts, but also to storytelling and to personal stories. And so we created uh, that video that you watched about the families um, that data is actually the top four drops uh, per family is what you're seeing. Um, there's also a longer version of that video if you go to organicforall.org. And we relied on many great partners to get that out. And we actually have over 330,000 views at this point. So I encourage you to share it far and wide and, and spread that message that organic works. These are other peer-reviewed studies that um, also demonstrate that an organic diet is associated with lower exposure to pesticides. Uh, the top ones are intervention studies like ours, and then the bottom are comparisons of um, different people self-reporting the amount of organic they eat. So why does organic work? Um, it's pretty obvious if we look at the fact that conventional farmers are allowed to use over 900 different synthetic active uh, ingredients. And that's, you know, those are turned into many, many, many thousands of different pesticide formulations. Uh, whereas organic farmers are only yet allowed to use 25 synthetic active ingredients. And they're required to first use other methods to try to control the, the insects or the weeds of concern. Um, so things like crop rotations, cover cropping, composting to build healthy soil, which uh, creates more resilient plants. And then of those 25, um, you can see it, some of these are um, not associated with any health concern um, whatsoever. Um, others like copper sulfate uh, were more concerned about. Um, but on the whole, organic is a dramatically less toxic 
uh, mode of production. We also find health benefits associated with an organic diet. So our diet was only assessing exposure and drop in exposure to pesticides, not health outcomes. Um, but these are three studies where you can see that uh, people who report eating um, more organic food, and you know, there's different tiers of what that more means for each of these studies, uh, have reduced risk of cancer, improved fertility outcomes, and reduced risk of diabetes. These are, of course, more difficult studies to do because the, the health benefits um, we would expect to see over a much longer period of time rather than a, a short one-week intervention. Um, there's a whole other set of benefits associated with organic production. So this is my snapshot of what concerns might we have related to the food system. And what you're seeing on the top, pesticide use, uh, dead zones and waterways associated with overuse of synthetic fertilizers, antibiotic resistance, pollinator decline, um, labor concerns, climate change, of course, soil erosion, animal welfare, the ability of small farmers and businesses to survive, um, and then long distance travel. So of these, I am giving Organic a gold star on all of um, those in the top row because it, it really um, goes a long way to addressing uh, these problems. And, and there's great data to show that. Um, and I'm, I'm giving <laughs> blue and green stars, um, sort of second and third tier to these other concerns. So you can see, you know, for example, for climate change, we know that organic uh, systems sequester more carbon in the soil than conventional systems. They also um, use less energy and emit fewer greenhouse gases. Um, so all sorts of benefits it, that we would get from shifting towards an organic food system. And despite that, uh, the public narrative um, really um, continues to have myths and misunderstandings about organic. And I have to say, when I talk to college classes, I often start out, you know, what do you think of when I say organic? And you each can think of that yourselves. Like, what comes to mind first? And the things that I typically hear are, um, it's elitist, it's greenwashing, and organic uses pesticides too, and so it's not worth it. And these are actually messages that have been um, generated and promoted by the, the pesticide industry. And we know that because we did an investigative report a couple of years ago that shows that pesticide companies have really taken a page from the tobacco industry playbook and are using um, the same types of misinformation campaigns. Um, you know, writers who appear to be independent journalists who are in fact funded by industry uh, to get these messages out, to sow doubt, um, and and to uh, manipulate uh, scientific data that's there, both on the harm of pesticides and on the benefit of organic. And the stakes are really high here for both the public and policymakers understanding the harms of pesticides um, and also the fact that we've already got a system of production that works and that we could shift policy support to very rapidly. Um, this is Linda Birnbaum, head of NIEHS, who's saying not just uh, about pesticide regulations, but regulations of so many environmental toxicants are uh, outdated. They are not in step with the latest science that shows, um, in particular, that very low levels of exposure can cause hormone disruption, which then leads to a, a whole set of negative health outcomes. This is a good article that uh, discusses the problem with the legal limits of food residues that are allowed uh, in the US. Um, so I included the URL there if you want to look that up. Um, and you know, going back to the fact that we're exposed to cumulative amounts, that some uh, pesticides we're finding have synergistic impacts. They can actually amplify uh, the, the toxicity um, of each other. Uh, and then, and I should say, of course, the tolerances also are not protective of those who are most vulnerable among us, who are um, babies in utero, infants, and children. 
So we really are invested in a, a sort of judo here, of flipping that narrative of organic as elitist on its head. Because if you look from another angle and consider the fact that we are all daily exposed to pesticides linked to a range of health harms, um, organic becomes a human right. That we all have the right to not be exposed to toxic pesticides. Um, and we have a, a true solution that we could invest in. And so we are working to make organic uh, organic for all. And that will take a massive overhaul of our policy system because right now our policies overwhelmingly support chemical intensive agriculture. We've been working with organizations across the country, um, including Latino farmer Latino Farmer and Rancher Trade Association, um, of which Rudy Ardondo here is the president. Uh, this is an op-ed that he published in, in relation to the study, um, saying clearly that organic also has benefits to farm workers because it reduces exposure uh, to farm workers, to rural communities. So again, really flipping that on its head. Um, organic is, is far from elitist because it can protect those of us who are most at risk of pesticide exposure. So all of that uh, and more is at organicforall.org. Um, data and citations uh, on associations with health, uh, rural communities, pollinators and the environment. Um, and if you're looking for just succinct information, the FAQ at the top, um, has good information and also we provided links to PDFs that have all of the citations um, there and throughout the website. So you might think that's all well and good, organic can reduce exposure to pesticides, but can it quote unquote feed the world? And this is a really powerful idea when we think about our food system. We, we have the sense that uh, American farmers are feeding the world, um, which is not true, we know. Um, that the, the corn and soy, which are um, some of our main products, are really feeding livestock, uh, going to make biofuels, um, and that the small farmers around the world um, are those who are primarily feeding themselves. Um, the idea of feeding the world gets invoked in a way that really supports our chemical intensive food system. But the expert consensus is that in fact, if we want to feed all people sustainably into the future, we, we need to shift to an ecological approach to farming because we are in essence uh, sawing off the branch that we're sitting on. Our current mode of industrial food production um, has so many environmental concerns linked to it that it really undermines our ability to continue so these are some great resources um, that address that question. Up in the left, um, that agriculture to crossroads, that is um, sort of the IPCC of agriculture. Um, so like we have expert consensus around climate change, this is an expert consensus document of, of hundreds uh, of scientists and, and others around the world. Um, and the Farming for the Futures of Friends of the Earth report that uh, addresses three myths about um, feeding the world and summarizes the, the state of the science. Um, so those are, are two useful resources. So I wanna talk a bit about um, what, how do we create change? How do we move towards a, a healthier, more sustainable food system? And at Friends of the Earth, we think about this as a three-legged stool. Uh, we do market change campaigns, policy change, and also science and uh, storytelling as ways to get that, that scientific knowledge out to a wide audience. So I want to start with some of the great work that's happening in hospitals and healthcare systems across the country. And this is not Friends of the Earth's work. Um, this is Healthcare Without Harm. And um, for a number of years, I worked with them on hospital food procurement and hospitals like this is San Francisco General, um, working really hard to align their patient food service and their cafeterias with uh, their sustainability principles and their understanding of the links between food and health. So uh, hundreds of hospitals have signed this Healthy Food and Healthcare Pledge and are 
uh, doing all sorts of great things to, to put that into practice. Um, one of the, the projects that we worked on in the Bay Area for a number of years was the Farm Fresh Healthcare Project, and this was getting uh, local and organic produce into a set of hospitals, um, and even at times coordinating those hospitals so that they uh, could pool their demand um, and, and really encourage their um, the middlemen in that supply chain to, to meet that demand for them. So that how-to guide is available online. Friends of the Earth, um, has an ongoing campaign targeting national food retailers. And we are asking them to increase their organic offerings, uh, to phase out some of the most toxic pesticides out of their supply chains, organophosphates, glyphosate, and neonicotinoids, and to publicly disclose their progress towards those goals. Um, one win last year was Costco updating its pollinator health policy to encourage all of its fruit and vegetable growers to a phase out use of neonicotinoids and um, this is a it it's doesn't have teeth and so um, this is the sort of thing that we are excited to see uh, companies talking about this and taking steps um, but the the next steps of this campaign are um, really to make sure that some of these policies um, have, have teeth to them and some measurable outcomes. So we'll be releasing a scorecard this fall. We've done two others um, that rate uh, grocers. And of course, most are not doing very well at all when it comes to reducing use of toxic pesticides. To um, really move that campaign along, we did some food testing last year so we uh, shopped with our allies in 13 states across the country you can or 15 i'm sorry um the ones that are uh, in dark green and we shopped for the house brands um, at these retailers these are some of the most affordable um, foods in the store and also supply chains that those companies have more control over because they are their own house um, uh, products. So here's a snapshot of what we found, and this really is aligned with uh, the USDA data and with other uh, testing data. In particular, uh, we found high levels of glyphosate in oat cereals and in pinto beans. Um, this would be true of any oat products. And But, um, can you hear me again? We can, yes. Great. Okay. Um, and where did I lose you? <laughs> were we right here? Yep. This is the slide we were on. Okay. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, so uh, you can see, um, and, and briefly I'll recap, I was saying um, high levels of glyphosate in crops uh, where we're using this herbicide to dry down. Uh, the crops to make harvest quicker and easier, um, but that results in particularly high levels of exposure. Um, and then neonicotinoids uh, and organophosphates, and, and that data really um, uh, is aligned with USDA data. Uh, and I should say, as a result of this, um, we got interest from some sustainable investment shareholder groups um, who are uh, now talking about uh, how do they make this a part of their activism with these companies um, you know that they sh hold shares in um, so that's one 
other way that we can think about creating positive change. We are invested in state work across the country. Um, this is Dr. Devin Payne Sturgis, um, who you may have seen in the video, who also is really active with Maryland Pesticide Education Network. Um, unfortunately, Maryland did not pass a ban on chlorpyrifos this year, despite some really amazing efforts. We did, however, see bans in California and New York, which is really exciting. So, you know, given the fact that the federal government um, backpedaled on their ban of chlorpyrifos, some states have been stepping into that gap. Um, Hawaii banned it in 2018, um, and, and then uh, we are uh, set to see hopefully some bans as well in Oregon, Connecticut, and New Jersey. Consumer use, so your ability to go into a store and buy a product with chlorpyrifos in it to use in your home has been banned since 2000, and that's because um, even back then we had enough data that shows that chlorpyrifos is very harmful to infants and children. Um, so despite all that data, we're still using it um, significantly in agriculture, unfortunately. There are two uh, bills, both in the House and in the Senate, to ban pesticide, uh, ban the purifos, sorry, and those um, have been gaining some momentum and co-sponsors, so we will continue to work on those as well, because we don't expect the EPA to take action. Um, for glyphosate, uh, it's been banned and restricted in many locations worldwide. Uh, France and Germany, in particular, have set restrictions on it. We have no restrictions in the U.S. currently. Um, we do have a, a new bill that's been introduced in the House to keep food safe from glyphosate act, although I do wish they had rephrased that because it's not about keeping food safe. Um, it's about keeping our children and all of us safe. Uh, but this act would do three things. It would require USDA to test for glyphosate food residues, and that may be um, uh, shocking or surprising we don't test for glyphosate food residues. Um, historically, glyphosate has been left out. Um, uh, Monsanto is the manufacturer of glyphosate. Uh, glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup, which is uh, probably a name that you recognize and something that many people use on their lawns, something that's used a lot also in parks and schools. Um, and, uh, you know, Monsanto has succeeded in um, really pushing the narrative that glyphosate is safe for years, despite the fact that the initial assessment from the EPA in the early 80s determined that glyphosate was a probable carcinogen. Um, there's a, a book that I'll show you at the very end, Whitewash, that goes into the long history of influence uh, of Monsanto at the EPA really standing in the way of um, smart regulation of this pesticide that we've known for a long time is harmful to health. Um, so this would test for residues. It would um, ban that practice that I mentioned of spraying glyphosate as a pre-harvest drying agent. And then it would require EPA to drop the food tolerance back down to 0.1 parts per million. Um, it, and I don't know off the top of my head where it's at right now, um, but I know that it's three times above what the EU food tolerance is. Again, um, under influence from Monsanto, the EPA has bumped up that tolerance as we've seen increasing amounts of glyphosate used in our food system. You may have seen in the news recently, uh, glyphosate has been making huge headlines through a series of trials um, which all have been decided in favor of the plaintiffs. So these are all cases where the plaintiffs um, feel that their non-Hodgkin's lymphoma has been linked to their use of uh, Roundup. Um, and in all three cases, the, the jury has both determined uh, that, yes, um, the data is clear that Roundup um, could have reasonably caused their non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, as well as determining that Monsanto acted 
in malice, uh, which is the legal term that Monsanto knew for years and years about the problematic uh, outcomes linked to glyphosate and yet continued to um, uh, market this uh, herbicide as safe. Uh, legal work on, uh, or policy work on neonicotinoids, uh, it was banned for all outdoor agricultural use last year in the European Union, which is really wonderful news. Um, and I shouldn't say it, but they, this is a whole class of pesticides. Consumer use is banned in Maryland, Connecticut, and Vermont. And um, we've been working both on those state level bans and then with cities and universities and, and others to restrict use. So neonicotinoids are uh, associated with pollinator decline. There is ever more data that shows that these pesticides are highly toxic to pollinators and other insects, and they've created a compounding toxicity in the, in the environment because they don't readily break down um, in the way that some of the pesticides historically used do. Um, so really, if you see headlines about insect apocalypse, about second silent spring, um, although those are very dramatic terms, we are um, experiencing a experience a dramatically higher toxic load in the environment for insects as a result of neonicotinoid use. So um, we've been working really hard to uh, restrict and phase out use. Um, we have ongoing state bill efforts in New York and New Jersey, and then uh, nationally, the Saving America's Pollinator Act. And then just uh, yesterday, the day before, uh, the National Protect Our Refuges Act was introduced and that's because, again, this administration reversed an Obama-era ban on the use of neonicotinoids in national wildlife refuges. Um, along with restricting toxic pesticides, uh, ourselves and, of course, many, many other groups across the country are working to expand sustainable food systems. And so part of this, we are really um, making sure that the momentum around a Green New Deal includes uh, policy outcomes around organic and other ecological uh, methods of farming. Um, and I should say, if you, if you don't know, our national farm policy is set every five years in something called the Farm Bill. Um, and that was negotiated last year, so we're we're now um, gearing up uh, for the, the next farm bill um, over the coming years. But that really is the legislation that um, determines the, the rules of the game. And that's where we can dramatically shift our support from a chemical intensive food system to an organic food system. Um, some good news is that we're seeing increasing bipartisan support for um, funding for organic programs, although it is still, you know, fractions of a penny on a dollar compared to um, the funding for conventional agriculture. Uh, we, we know that because it is a, also a wonderful rural development tool um, that some um, legislators from rural um, states and um, and districts are understanding that organic is a, is a really important part of our food system. So I'm going to leave you here at the end with a couple of my favorite quotes that uh, really inspire my work. Uh, Rachel Carson, of course, who sounded the alarm back in the 60s on our increasing use of agricultural pesticides and that they are harming not only the environment, um, but also us. She says, man is a part of nature, and his war against nature is inevitably a war against himself. And Albrecht Beck, who writes um, in Risk Society, which is really a book about a society grappling with new risks associated with industrialization, as we participate with our bodies in a metabolic process and can be eroded like the stones of trees. And so I find that work on pesticides and other environmental toxicants can be such a powerful platform for change because people can relate that this is about our own bodies, it's about our, our children and our families. 
Here are some resources, some organizations that do great work on pesticides uh, and just cruising around their websites will give you a wealth of information. Beyond Pesticides in particular has a, a health database uh, that might be really useful to some of you um, that just sort of collates the available science on different uh, health problems linked to pesticides. The book that I mentioned that goes into the, um, the backstory of glyphosate is Whitewash by Carrie Gillum. Um, it's, it reads like a political thriller, <laughs> um, but, but is the, the true story of why we're in a, in a place where this toxic herbicide is now the most widely used herbicide globally. And then a couple of resources that give you more background on farm worker exposure. And if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to email me. Um, there is my email address. And Mara, with that, maybe I'll turn it back over to you for Q&A. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, thanks again, Kendra, for taking the time to present for us today. Um, we're going to let folks um, start sending in their questions. So we'll give folks just a minute for that. Um, but I'm also going to let uh, Rebecca or Melissa here at the Ecology Center jump in if they have any questions to kick us off. Hi, can folks hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Oh. Okay, good. Uh, this is Rebecca with the Ecology Center. And one of the things I was wondering um, is we're, we've been doing some work and our fellows may work with us as well at a, at a local level. And I wondered if there were any sort of local actions. You know, we still have a tough legislature to get policy work through um, at the state level, but I wondered about uh, any initiatives that you could point us to that have been successful working with um, either city councils or or uh, procurement policies with um, city purchasers or anything like that? Absolutely. Um, so at the local level, uh, you know, there if we think about our need is both to reduce the use of toxic pesticides we're using and to promote organic and other sustainable um, models. And so on the reduction side, actually at the Friends of the Earth website, if you go to issues and then you go to um, B action, we've got a toolkit that um, might be useful for um, cities, people who want to take action at the city level. Um, we use it for students who want to take action at universities to pass policies to restrict use. Um, so certainly, uh, we've we've seen some great wins. Yesterday, in fact, uh, the University of California system announced that they are fully phasing out use of glyphosate. Um, you know, it's a widely used herbicide for lawn and park care, and so widely used on campuses. So that's um, really encouraging, and something that other universities could uh, adopt. Um, also. On the local level, procurement, um, so city procurement, um, institutional procurement for hospitals and schools is another really powerful lever for change. Um, yeah, I've talked primarily about pesticides, but we also work on reducing meat consumption in the food system because we know that uh, it's associated with negative health outcomes. Americans over consume meat and uh, it's associated with the greatest greenhouse gas emissions and climate impact of any of the foods in our food system, particularly red meat. So another good local um, model is uh, Washington DC last year passed um, a, a policy that says that all schools have to offer at least one plant-based option. I forget the details of it, but it's uh, helping schools to shift um, not entirely away from meat, of course, but just to reduce and offer plant-based options. 
Um, and then of course, uh, procurement dollars can be used to purchase more organic. Um, that can be difficult because organic is more expensive than conventional uh, most of the time, although sometimes local and in season it's not. And just to give you an understanding of why that is, um, organic farmers aren't subsidized in the way that conventional farmers are. So our, our food that appears to be very cheap, um, you know, conventional food is artificially so because of government subsidies. Um, and, you know, is not cheap if we think about the health impacts and the environmental impacts associated with it. So the cost of organic food actually more accurately reflects the true cost of food production um, and you know, also encompasses uh, a, a range of benefits that we're getting from organic systems. But uh, we, we can envision um, policy support for organic farmers in a way that would bring the price down for consumers without squeezing those organic farmers. Um, the, those are just a, a few thoughts. And I can um, think, you know, are there any other resources that I know of that I might be able to email you that you could send out to folks as well? Like that Farm Fresh Healthcare how-to guide might be a good one. That would be great. Thank you. You bet. All right, great. So we had a question come in. Um, from Melissa, she often sees pesticide spray signs on hospital grounds. Um, would it be effective for health professionals to work to move their facilities to organic lawn care? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, you know, the, um, there would be great models of institutions and cities that have moved towards integrated pest management. Um, and that is a, a model it, there's a whole range, you know, there's sort of a weak IPM and strong IPM and, and everything in between. Um, so, it, you know, if you're doing that sort of work, I would um, maybe direct you to resources like the IPM Institute. Beyond Pesticides, I know, has a good, strong definition of IPM. But it's a, a model that um, encourages dramatic reduction in pesticide use, both for farming, but also for um, lawn care, and it would be wonderful um, for hospitals to be shifting to IPM um, management of hospital grounds. Any other questions? So another question that I have is, um, are there other things that, um, and again, I'm, I guess I'm just thinking with a public policy hat on here, are there other things that we might be able to do with our current administration that, would, that wouldn't need um, you know, legislative approval, because it's difficult to, to move things right now in Michigan's legislature, but we have a very friendly governor. Um, and uh, there's a lot going on here in Michigan, particularly with our PFAS crisis. Um, but I wondered if there's anything else we should be thinking of bringing up um, when our fellows um, and or ourselves here at the Ecology Center have conversations with our administration. And it's a good question. and. Um Difficult to answer without knowing um, anything at all about the political landscape in Michigan. <laughs> right. Um, so we have a, a brand new Democratic governor um, who's been, um, you know, good on environmental issues, hasn't focused on the agricultural side. So in, in some ways, it might be the question, a better question might be, what are the when we meet with either her ag staff or her environmental staff, what introductory material should we be bringing? Um, to her and her team to talk about these issues and to get them up to speed on how from an administrative um, mm -hmm. perspective they could do more on pesticides even without the legislature. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that um, one sort of barrier for legislators 
is the sense that farmers need pesticides and that by um, you know, envisioning a, a agricultural system that relies less on pesticides, we're in fact putting farmers in a difficult position. Um, and so I think that data that demonstrate, um, and I'm thinking there, there was a study in Nature a year or two ago that shows that in fact, most farmers could reduce pesticide use without any impact on their yields um, or, or their income. And so I think that those sort of findings, you know, there's, there's both, okay, here's the harm of pesticides, we know this, there's, there's growing data. Um, we know that farmers can reduce use um, by adopting more ecological methods. And it's the methods that really are the heart of organic farming. So working with natural systems, I, as I mentioned, you know, um, cover cropping or intercropping, um, planting trap crops, which lure pests out of your um, primary crops, uh, composting, things like that, that any farmer can adopt. And so, um, you know, there are now some really exciting soil health policies that are being passed in states around the country. And unfortunately, um, don't know that any of them talk about pesticide reduction, but they talk about supporting farmers to adopt those ecological farming mm -hmm. methods. Um, so I think that sort of information that makes it clear that we do have solutions and um, that those solutions can really benefit farmers rather than working against them are very important. That and makes sense. And maybe highlighting incentives that the administration might be able to forward without the legislature to justify yeah. some of those production policies. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, so another model, and this is policy, and so maybe not applicable, but um, in California, there's a new bill that um, is seeking to get funding for some pilots for public schools um, that ha that serve a lot of free and reduced um, meals to increase their purchasing of organic um, with a, a focus on um, sourcing from California farmers. So, you know, there's a win-win a, a of supporting um, farmers in the state and also getting healthier food to children. Um, you know, so that would be another place where local purchasing and local purchasing of organic has, you know, multiplier effect for Michigan. Um, yeah. So we have another question for Cecilia, but I want to ask just a, a follow up um, to that point. When we've talked with folks in um, certain school districts here, like our partners in Ann Arbor School District, they have a challenge in that most many school districts don't have kitchens to actually do a lot of the processing anymore themselves. And is that something that you've encountered? And are there ways that um, you know those districts that can't necessarily put in a kitchen in every school um, to do food prep and things like that with more whole ingredients. Are there ways around that for institutions? That is a, a great question and our, our school food work is not um, under my purview. So I have okay. a couple of colleagues who I'm sure could answer that question for you. I do know, you know one of the things they're working on also is policy support to help schools switch back to having kitchens because the ability to do at least some in-house prep is so fundamental to their ability to, yeah. to shift their procurement. So I know that's a, a huge roadblock. So that may be actually the, the first best step for us to take here. Yeah, yeah. And there's we've got a, a resource um, that I can also send a link if you want to share with folks. Uh, a uh, how-to guide on increasing climate-friendly food in schools. So again, not necessarily organic, but um, moving towards plant-based menus um, that might have some, I, it's got so many links and resources in it, so something in there might uh, be of service to that question. Fantastic. Um, so Cecilia's question is, why are organic farmers not subsidized similar to other farmers? Um, that's a great question. Um, if we look at the history of organic farming, 
uh, it really, it, it now is about a $50 billion industry. So it's grown really rapidly. It's the, the always the fastest growing segment of the food system. Um, but really organic farmers um, existed outside of, of the uh, system. They were developing a model that um, was dramatically different from, from conventional farming. Um, in, let's see, the, the organic label that you see in the supermarket uh, came into effect, I believe, in 2002. So there's a point at which uh, there was enough fraud and people claiming to be organic who weren't that the farmers and, and those in the movement itself went to the federal government and said, we need an organic label, we need regulations. And so the organic label is really the most robust and the most transparent food label on the market. It's backed by federal law and it's overseen by a body of uh, stakeholders, um, independent stakeholders uh, called the National Organic Standards Board. Um, and they are tasked with keeping the organic standard strong. So the, the relationship between um, organic and the federal government has been through that label and through the National Organic Program but historically the USDA has been um, uh, very unfriendly, <laughs> very unfriendly um, to organic um, and has sort of said, okay, fine, you're a marketing niche and so we'll, we'll support you in that way, but has not historically um, seen organic as um, you know, a, a, a program or a, a channel through which they want to um, send any funding. And so it's really been a, a fight to help legislators understand so that they can put pressure um, on the USDA and then to do internal education at the USDA um, to help people understand why organic is a, a really positive part of our food system. So it's really just historically, you know, the um, relationship between USDA and organic. My hope is that increasingly, as we saw in the last Farm Bill, we did achieve um, increased research funding for organic. We achieved increased funding for um, oversight of international organic supply chains to make sure that there's not fraud. Uh, we, we got some great wins, and so I'm hopeful that we'll continue to build that momentum. Um, it's still like less than 2% of any of our agricultural research dollars federally go to organic. I mean, it's, it's really just still the unloved stepchild in a way, um, but it will, it will take continued efforts, um, education and pressure. And, you know, I would say it's a place where I think health professionals really, um, you know, you've, you've got um, the moral authority um, and you, when you speak to legislators, I think that carries a lot of weight. And so um, weighing in and um, even if it's just uh, letting your legislators know, I, I understand pesticides are a problem. I understand organic is a solution. And you know, I expect you to be, to be working towards that is a really important part of continuing to build this momentum. Great, thanks, Kendra. Um, we have another question that came in from Patrick. Um, he was wondering, given the issues we're seeing with immigration in the United States, have we seen more negative health outcomes in migrant workers due to pesticides as they may be more reluctant to visit healthcare providers? Mm, you know, that that's historical, absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I don't know necessarily how the current situation has shaped that, but uh, those, those couple reports that I, and I'll go back to them about farm worker health there on the bottom. Um, so farm workers not only are more exposed to pesticides, but have um, so few rights and um, so much fear standing in the way of reporting. So like pesticide poisonings, which we think there are maybe 10 to 20,000 a year, direct poisonings, 
And that's likely a dramatic underestimate because may, many farm workers are likely not seeking the health, um, health uh, services that they need. Um, so really there are so many compounding forces that, um, you know, that mean that this is one of our most vulnerable populations. And if you don't know, farm workers have been left out of our national workers' rights uh, policies. They don't get overtime pay. They don't um, have protection to to unionize. Um, you know, and there's historical forces. Uh, I'm thinking of a book called *The Conquest of Bread* by Richard Walker, which really gets into historically why this is the most marginalized workforce. Um, so, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, farm workers are are at very high risk and certainly not receiving the care that they need. So um, another question um, here. So we have been sort of on the front lines of, of the PFOS crisis here in Michigan and have been doing extensive testing and things like that. And I wondered, um, and sorry to spring this on you, I wondered if you have anything um, that you might say on the connection between um, pesticides fertil and fertilizers and how PFAS is sometimes used in them to actually help spread them more quickly and evenly, um, if, that's, if that's something that you have, you know, there's this synergy between pesticides and this other class of industrial toxicants, um, or, or, and or, um, any thoughts on the use of biosolids um, it, or sewage sludge, essentially, to use DAS fertilizers and contamination with PFAS and, and other chemicals there? Yeah. So those are both beyond my realm of expertise. So I'm not, I'm not even going to venture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, um, sounds like I'd love to have a conversation with you about them because uh, you've clearly been, been thinking about those. Great. Well, let's make that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, seeing as there are no more questions in the queue, um, Kendra, I wanna thank you again so much for taking the time for um, presenting to us today. A um, Couple quick little housekeeping items before we wrap up today's presentation. Um, evaluation, so our webinar evaluation is required for all current Health Leaders Fellows. However, we also strongly encourage all other participants to complete the survey as well, as your feedback is valuable in planning future meetings. So I'm going to send that out in the chat box as well, and that way you have that link. So you should see that now. Um, and our next event will be our Toxics 201 webinar. We'll be joined by uh, Courtney Kerr, Karagnan from Michigan State University. Uh, this webinar will cover toxic chemicals of concern, including flame retardants and PFOS. So another quick plug for PFOS there as well. Um, and that registration link is up on the screen now. I will also send it out via the chat box so that folks have access to it. And with that, um, I really just want to thank you again, Kendra, for taking the time with, for speaking with us today and sharing all of the knowledge that you have and um, explaining some ways that folks can get involved and take action. And with that, I'd like to thank all of our participants for today for joining us. Um, thanks again and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks so much.